And I'm absolutely not dissing AI in any way. I'm dissing the concept of people saying that there won't be any jobs left for them. There won't be any jobs left for the shit people. I kind of had a similar co conversation in a different way with my, my video editor back in the UK, actually. Your competition isn't really other video editors. Your competition is my 16-year-old daughter. What tools can make your job better? What tools can make you more efficient? If my daughter, with no training, can make a great video with this TikTok app in 15 minutes, you as an experienced editor can use that same app and blow, you know, blow the socks off everybody. Guys, Matt Haycock's here and welcome to another episode of the Matt Haycock Show where we're here in a new studio in Dubai with my new Dubai friend, Spencer Lodge. <laughs> He's told me I can introduce him as anything I want, but I am going to introduce him as entrepreneur, uh, financial advisor, podcast host, author, <laughs> Up and coming fitness guru and all and all around great guy. Uh, so Spencer, thanks a lot for being here. I mean, I, I know we've we've talked about this for a while, and and I've heard your name come up in just about uh, every circle I've been in in Dubai. So uh, I'm actually surprised it took us so long to meet. You spent a lot of time in the police station. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's funny, honestly. Every, I mean, literally every circle of differing people, and I say, oh, you know, um, anyone I should catch up with in Dubai, they always go, do you know Spencer Lodge? Really? Yeah, you look no. worried. No, no, no yeah. <laughs> I've been here 20, oh, 18 years, so I suppose that, that yeah, some people know me, but yeah. What, what brought you to Dubai? Business, yeah, work. So I'd been living overseas as an expat for, oh, 12, what was it, 12 years back then. I was in Holland, we bought a company over here, one of us decided we need to run it, and my business partners at the time, one of them was in Hong Kong, he's like, I'm not leaving Hong Kong. Dubai, why would you go to Dubai? Um, and I was in Holland it was freezing cold, just like English weather. So hands went up, I'll take that one. And uh, that's how it started. I mean, it was very much the same for me that the, I guess, you know, the weather and the accidental holiday brought me here. But I always say to, you know, to my mates or your know, business associates, colleagues back in the UK, that I cannot think of a better place in the world for, for doing business. I mean, it's just such a, such a hungry, and simultaneously friendly business environment over here. I mean, well, you've been here a lot longer than me, so but, you know, I don't know, you might have a different view on it, but I mean, I couldn't, couldn't speak more highly of the place. It, look, look, this place years ago used to have a lot of bureaucracy, which didn't make a whole load of sense. But, but when you look at what they've done in the best part of 51 years, no city in the world has ever done it. You know, no country in the world has ever done it. So you have to kind of take your hat off and say, you know, if you compared it to the bureaucracy of living in Brazil or, or in Thailand, where there's, you know, you're dealing with different languages and sometimes different alphabets as well, which makes it even more difficult to do business, then, then this place really is a, a place that wants business people to come to. It wants people to come and set up here, develop themselves, develop their businesses. And then geographically, it's in a really smart place in the world as well. I mean, never mind Brazil. I mean, but back in Leeds, I mean, it's been taking three and a half years to build a roundabout at the end of my street. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not joking. I, I, I used to go used to go back to England. And never mind, I used to go back. This is even when I was still living in England. I'd be thinking, oh, that blockage at the end of the road, you know, that'll be finished in a few weeks. I mean, th this is literally, it's, it's a roundabout with four minor roads coming off it. I mean, one of them's double width, but it's not a dual carriageway by any stretch. There's a little subway, a little post office there. I mean, that is the, you know, the business hub of the roundabout. And it took about three and a half years to finish this off. It's funny, you know, when you come <laughs> here and you see that, you go back home it's like what you go on holiday and you visit back to the uk again and there's still the roadworks are exactly the same as they were before yet here in dubai the roadworks go up a flyover goes up in 12 months and before you know it, it's done so we're recording this about 12 o'clock in the afternoon which uh, from what i've seen of you on instagram lately must be almost your bedtime because you i, I always see you driving driving down what must be Sheikh Zayed road at four, four o'clock in the morning Telling, telling people you're on the way to your workout. I'm, I do get very inspired and motivated by your workouts, workouts <laughs> myself, but there's not a chance I'm coming there with you at half five in the morning. Are you, are you a morning person? Is that why you're doing it? I, 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 I have always been a morning person, so that, there's nothing unusual there, but um, I, I think I need it. I think I need that set time every single day that I go. I like the fact that I'm going early before everybody else is up. I like the fact that I'm done, you know, just as the gym starts to get busy. Um, and it's me, yeah, that, that video that I make is 14 seconds every day of me driving down the, 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 the trunk on the Palm of the Golden Mile coming off my house. And that 14 seconds I film and then get back afterwards. And I think, what on earth am I going to say today? <laughs> and I have many people say, you know, you've motivated me to get up and do stuff. And then equally I've had people like, what are you doing, you weirdo? And one of them is my wife, so. <laughs> 
have you have you as have you always exercised? I mean, has, has fitness always been a part of your part of your your goals? I've always exercise but i don't think i've always exercised you know kind of like going to a gym every day like i have in the last probably seven or eight years i had spinal surgery in 2010 and then 2012 and after that recovery um i really needed to be in the gym and and cycling was what got me going into fitness properly um the only thing i could do was get on a bike and, and being bent forward stretched my spine and it took the pain away okay. so it was almost like being on a bike was comfortable whereas sitting on a sofa was painful and so it went from there to you know here in dubai if you ride a bike a lot you're going around a lot of kind of like sand views there's not really much else to see on these paths out in Al-Qudra and stuff like that and so it's like it gets boring and so what do you do do something else and say oh, I'll go to the gym and, and like anybody that goes to the gym you know the first probably three weeks of going to a gym is awful for anybody starting out you know you, you don't see any benefits it's just a you know a slog a labor of love and whatnot until after three weeks you start to feel like you belong a little bit more and and you know what you're doing you're familiar and um and maybe you start to feel a bit more stronger and fitter than you did before and i mean do you find it makes a difference for you in all the other aspects of your life so if you if I was to come here today, so we're here, we're here midday yet or 11 o'clock to do this. If I was to come today without going to the gym, I'm 20 to 30 percent at least worse in terms of my energy, in terms of my focus, my enthusiasm. Um, and it's exactly the same with my work. You know, I, once I get back from the gym, I have a shower and I'm ready to go at 645. Now, that seems mad for a lot of people, but I get so much done between 645 and 9 a.m that I've, I've, I've completed like all of my operational admin type functions by then. And so, yeah, and, and it feels good. There's something there's something that makes me feel good about that. I mean, it's a funny one because I mean, I'm completely with you on the exercise and that, uh, you know, I like to do mine in the morning I, I, for two reasons. One, I feel completely set up for the day with it. But then secondly, I also know that if I, I try and do it after work, something always happens at work, you know, and, and, and it'll get knocked back and knocked back and knocked back and potentially not happen or I'll, I'll be approaching it after, you know, a 10 hour day and I'll, I'll be too tired to do a proper job of it. But um I, I always uh, I always like seeing the kind of debate about early mornings online because it's obviously you know such a such social media fodder for the you know for, for the whole alpha male thing, and I'm you know more than happy to say that I've just I've never been a morning person. Uh, it's not, you know not because I'm I'm lazy about it, but I always go to bed quite late and I think okay you could go to bed earlier and then get up earlier, but I just don't want to. You know mm -hmm. I, I like I like I like being up late at night. I, I feel. Well, A, from a social perspective, that's where I, I, I kind of do a lot of my enjoyment or also working. But also, um, you know, it's, it's a good headspace for work for me as well. So I, what I like about being here is even though I live in Dubai, 90% of my work is still UK based. So I do work UK hours. So I, I'll, I'll get up here at, you know, half seven, eight o'clock in the morning. I then go and do my, I'll go and do my training probably, you know, half eight till half ten come home, see the missus, have a bit of breakfast, you know, do a few emails, potter around, and I get into the office for maybe half 11, which, you know, okay, someone said half 11, you know, you're so lazy, but bear in mind, it's still only half past seven in the UK. So I then get my couple of hours, where you say complete clear headspace, admin time, get my emails, get everything else done. And then I, you know, then I'll, I'll work late into, late into the- Hold on a minute, seven, hold on a minute. You've just said to me that the whole early morning thing doesn't work for you. And I, and I do, but if, if you're on UK time, you're doing exactly the same time as me in essence. No, well, that, that, that's, that's what I mean. But I mean, in terms of actually phys physically getting, physically getting up at, you know, and I put people, I, I kind of, uh, feel so competitive about it. Only you know, like, it's like to me. I want to be the last man in the office, no matter how efficient. I'm, so no matter how inefficient I'm being, you know, you've got to be the last man in the office. And you know, I, I want to be up earlier than the next person. But I, I know if, if I if I started coming to the gym with you at five o'clock in the morning. I'd be so grumpy. I'd be. I'd, I'd have been going to bed at you know twelve at best. You know one o'clock, two o'clock. So even if I get through the workout, I won't be doing my best job of it. And then I'm just going to be grumpy and knackered for the rest well, look, of the day. The, 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 my wife's a great example, and other people I know as well. Some people are really creative around midnight. You know, they're really creative and they're alive, and you know they're they're in they're in a really good place. I'm not mm. at, at midnight. I'm a zombie. But my wife, she's she, she's looking at me, and I'm like, babe, it's like ten thirty. Should we go to bed? And she's up. Like, what do you want to go to bed so early for? And I'm like, hun, it's 10.30, you know, we'll be asleep by 11. I get up at 4.30, that's five and a half hours sleep. And uh, she's like, yeah, go on your own. And she'll sit there and she'll be on the phone chatting to people at one o'clock in the morning. 
because and doing stuff with her colleagues from work all because that's that's that kind of time that they feel best mm. so there is no rule yeah this no, is what works for you I'm completely and that's what I wasn't absolutely wasn't saying you know you should be getting up in the morning I, I was just saying it in the context of that you know people need to need to know themselves and know, know what work, works yeah. for them and I think you know f f follow, following the you know uh, I don't know the stereotypical alpha male psych, psych, um, social media path isn't isn't, uh, isn't necessarily the best. Uh, I think I think what you must do is whatever time you get up, you must do some exercise. Yeah, that's all I think. So if you wake up at nine o'clock every day, you know, even if it's go for a walk, okay, do some form of exercise because I think it's better for you psychologically and emotionally and obviously physically if you do that. I think. Look. We've done the we've done the fitness, so let's move this in the chrono chronological order of your day. <laughs> Let, let's 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 talk about some business. Um, obviously, I, I always see you post very interesting things on social media. Uh, you know, some things that uh, I know a lot about and agree with, and other things that I'd, um, I'm always interested to think about picking your brains on. And uh, something that's always coming up online now is uh, AI, artificial intelligence, in particular with you know the whole G, you know, GB, Chat GPT, Chat GPT thing. Uh, I saw you post about it the other day. And when I knew we were doing this, I thought I, I thought I'd kind of pick your brains as, as, to, as to where you're at and, and, and what you think's going on. I mean, I've got my own very clear views on how it's definitely a great step forward, but is and and is a tool that can help people if they understand how to use it in the right way. But is absolutely, you know, not a let's say a robotic replacement to the rest of the world, and that you know, 97% of the population are going to be unemployed. But uh, uh, you know, I've got probably 1% one, 1 knowledge compared to what you've got. So I'd, I'd love to love to hear your views. And, well, uh, I, think, I think my knowledge is, is, is just through experience. I mean, have you tried ChatGPT? I have, yes. I've, I've tried, I've tried. Have you tried it on your phone or a laptop? Uh, the laptop, I believe, the laptop. So I've been using it over the last few days quite extensively. And for, for what to play with or for a particular purpose? Because I, I wanted to see, because I have a team of copywriters that work with me. Uh, this is exactly where I've, I've, so, I've been. So um, I've, been, I've been literally working out whether I can replace the copywriters with chat GPT and GPT. And from everything I've created so far, 100%. Really? 100%. So now, then if you go to another app, another AI app called Tome, so T-O-M-E, okay, that is an AI app that designs PowerPoint presentations. And anybody that knows me well knows that I hate doing PowerPoints. Like it's like frustrating for me. It's labor intensive. It's it's manual. It's a real struggle. If I have someone sat there and I'm talking and they're turning it into a PowerPoint presentation, that's one thing. But if I got to do it myself, I will put it off and put it off and put it off until the cows come home, until there's a real deadline. So I'll use a PowerPoint for a speaking engagement. And so I'll know the speaking engagement is the 25th of the month. It won't be done till the 24th, late at night. And I'll be laying there going, oh, I didn't want to do it anyway. I used Tome yesterday to design a PowerPoint presentation. And it designed it in less than a minute. And it was good. Now, was it perfect? No, of course it wasn't perfect, but it was good. And I sat there going, you're kidding me. That amount of time that I can save, or anybody else for that matter that has to go and design them, can go onto this website, design their PowerPoint presentation, export it, and it can be, and, and wonderful graphics and art and whatnot on there too. I thought it was amazing. So. When I when I look at AI in in the areas that I've looked at so far and I see the use cases for it, then I'm a massive, a massive fan. And it's only going to get better. And and proof of how good it is, because we could all be we could all and my personal trainer was talking negatively about some of it today. Microsoft are about to pay $10 billion to uh, ChatGBT, OpenSea, the uh, open AI, sorry, who's the parent company. $10 billion to buy a portion of the shares of a company that are valued at $29 billion. What were they valued at two years ago? Do you know? No. Nothing. I was going to say nothing, but yeah. 29 billion. Now, if you and I set a company up that we knew was $20, $29 billion in two years, okay, we'd have big smiles on our faces. <laughs> we're certainly very happy bit boys. What they're going to do is we have Google, which we go and we use. We say Google, we use Google, we Google it. We don't Bing it. We don't internet explore it. We we Google it. Yeah. So, but you know that Bing's there. Bing was there before. It was there. Search engine, just like anything else, but nobody uses it. Well, ChatGPT is going to be inserted into Bing. And if it's inserted into Bing, then any search you do is going to be an AI-based search, which is going to be a thousand percent better than any Google search that you do. 
That to me is really, really interesting. And I don't think that Microsoft would ever consider spending that kind of money unless there was real value in it. So I guess, so I'm with you on certain bits of that. And I guess where I'm more thinking of it is in terms of, it's a helpful tool to help people who don't want to be lazy, be more efficient at being good. Now, I feel like I've probably completely butchered what I meant to say there. And <laughs> that sounds even more complicated. You people be more efficient with their time. <laughs> As, as long as long as you've got a quality skill set to add on top of it, anyway, so let's, let's let's use copywriting. And, and for me, for me, I guess it depends on the quality of copy you want. But I mean, I, I always have a battle finding good copywriters. And uh, you know, I mean, I, I create a lot of copy across across all my businesses from a fashion perspective, from a uh, from a, from a business perspective. I mean, we're, we're always looking for good copywriters. And uh, I have this conversation with copywriters all the time. I mean, literally, I've interviewed four or five this week, and I'll always say that I know a good copywriter will say that they can write copy about anything because they'll say it's about research and it's about applying that research to a tone of voice. But I do disagree because I think it depends on who your audience is. Because if, you are, if you're if you writing something for SEO purposes, you know, if, if you're writing something for, for Google ability, then fine, uh, you know, probably any, any decent linguist with half a brain to research can do something about it. But if you're writing for a knowledgeable audience, then I honestly believe that any, any knowledgeable audience audience can, you know, can, can see through the writer. So when I'm writing copy or when I'm having copy written for about business finance, about investment, etc. You know, for me, I can tell in three seconds whether or not that's been written by someone who really, really know, really, really knows it or whether it's someone who's just, you know, who's just done some 10 minutes of research and yeah. string, string it together. So I've been testing um, you know, ChatGPT as well from a copywriting perspective. And listen, don't get me wrong, I find it incredibly impressive. I mean, like, you know, like it staggers me. And, and I could say, I don't know, give me, give me a 2000 word blog um, with 10 points about how to protect your business from the 2023 recession. You know, that'd be a nice blog title and, and, and something. And it would spit it out, as you know, in 20 seconds. Is the quality of it amazing well no it's for me it's not amazing okay it might be enough to get past seo it might be enough to get past a you know a, a wannabe business person who who, who are, they then can go in the top of the funnel to sell them a product but to, to really make me let's say look impressive as a as an author or impressive as a businessman i think i think it's quite way off but what i think it's a great job for is saving my time in researching those those 10 those 10 points you know it, it, i can ask if i want to write about five good points i'll ask it to give me 10 i can pick the i can pick the best ones and then i can kind of i can kind of get down okay. into it does so that, does that make sense yeah it makes sense completely so this this is what i've noticed by doing the research i researched um write a 500 word article about um uh inflation or i, I did it on a number of different things then i changed the way i asked the question in the voice of jk rowling or in the voice of Warren Buffett, give me the 10 most important considerations when investing money in 2023. It changes it completely because all of a sudden you've got, as you know, someone that we would both respect, somebody like Warren Buffett, it's in his voice and he's an expert in that field, we would guess. And whether that's Warren Buffett, Peter Thiel, or whatever it is. Also on top of that, if you think about, you know, my background is investing and financial advice. I have been using it to design portfolios for people. Okay, just testing. You no, know? design a portfolio for someone to invest $100,000 at an 8% return over the course of 2023. In the voice of Peter Thiel, uh, Peter Thiel, who's a who's a, an yeah. investment guru. It's good. But how how much meddling do you then do with it afterwards? Or is it literally good enough to just to present to a client then? No, no, no. I mean, I'm not even at the, at the stage where it will be presented to anybody, even, even but, no, the but stuff if you want I've it, done. Yeah. But it, like you said, it's like you go and do all the research yourself, which takes hours and hours and hours, and then you collate that research, then you have to put something together, which for people like us is like labor intensive and time consuming. If you can put something together very quickly, and then you can pick out the bits that you think are really valuable, all you're doing is copy and pasting and adding a few words. That's a massive time saver. And there'll be people out there that go, that's wrong. You're putting stuff out there. You should be using your own brain and thinking about it yourself. But everybody in business has a labor intensive tasks they have to do. And if there's a tool out there that can help them save time so they can be more productive with their business, 
and it still does a good job, then I reckon they should. No, hundred percent. And you know what? As we're talking, I mean, I think we're saying we're both saying the same thing. We're, we're, we're just saying it in different ways. As in, I'm absolutely not, uh, you know, not dissing AI in any way. I'm dissing the concept of uh, people saying that there won't be any jobs left for them. Uh, and you know, like with anything, there won't be any jobs left for the shit people. But you know, you, you're, you're talking about, for example, being a financial advisor and using that to make you more efficient. You know, to to to, to save your time. But you, you will then still need to look at it at the end and use your financial advisor skills that you've had years of education, years of practical experience to then actually look at it and go, mm, very, very good, Mr. AI. I need to tweak that, need to tweak that. And now it's put, now it's perfect for my clients. And I, I kind of had a similar conversation in a different way with my, my video editor back in the UK, actually, the other day, because I've really been hammering this year about getting out, uh, you know, getting more quantity of output out. I'm saying to him, look, I don't want to use the words quantity over quality because that's, I don't want to use it as an excuse of crap quality. But, you know, but the reality is, you know, when you put, let's say you're putting out a video on social, you could spend a day doing something that would be 100% perfect, or you could spend an hour doing something that's, let's say, 80% perfect. And the reality probably is that nobody else can see the you know, see the difference between that. So I'm saying our, our MO for the year is 80% because I want you to do it in an hour, not a day. And I want to get five, six, seven times the amount of content out. And I was saying to him, what you need to appreciate is, is you know, your competition isn't really other video editors. Your competition is my 16-year-old daughter sat at home with you know some fancy TikTok app where she can create a cool reel or a cool whatever in 15 minutes. But also don't look at that as a negative that I'm threatening you that you're gonna be out of a job and replaced by my, you know, by my daughter or by somebody else. Look at that as a positive that what tools can make your job better? What tools can make you more efficient? If my daughter with no training can make a great video with this TikTok app in 15 minutes. You as a you as an experienced editor can use that same app and blow you know blow the socks off everybody. So I, and when I was thinking about that, it was it was making me realize it's the same kind of comments you know that, that we can apply to chat chat GBT and, and things that you know look at any of these tools as something to make you more efficient, something to make you do a better job, something to move the world forward. But none of it should be making, you know, let's say making you lazy. Um, you know, the, the, the people who should be worried about it are the people who probably aren't capable in the first place. It's almost like when the, when, when the calculator came along, you know, people go, oh, well, you know, we, we don't need to do any work now. Well, okay, fine. You might think you don't need to do any work, but if you don't actually understand how to do the calculations behind the calculator, then ultimately you're going to be in a very dangerous or, or an employable position. I actually, you talk about calculators, I mean, I walked into uh, my accounts office back in the UK, which I go into very infrequently now. Uh, and I, I asked, uh, I wanted to ask one of the accountants how much was in the bank in one of the businesses. I forget the exact numbers, but the conversation went something like this. I said, how much is in that company? She goes, oh, well, there's, there's the main bank account and there's, and there's a PayPal account. I was like, okay. She goes, oh, it's 22 grand in the main account. It's about 1,500 quid in the PayPal account. And she said that. I'm, I've already obviously thought of what I wanted to think of and walking away. And I can see she pulls a calculator forward and she's tapping like this. So what are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm just adding 1,500 quid to 22,000. So, <laughs> so I can tell you how much is in the bank. I said, are you fucking kidding me? I said, if, I said, if you are going to use that calculator for that, I said, pack your bags and fuck off now. I said, you, <laughs> you're telling me you're a trained accountant and you want to use a calculator to calculate 22,000 plus 1,500 quid. I mean, like, what the fuck? And and that's that's the that's the lazy, laziness level that, that, that people have got to. And for me, you know, that's... You know the people who need to feel threatened about uh, about AI, about technological improvements. You know, are, are, the, are the ones who've got no value to add. Mm. Mm. I think that if you can use AI to design a spreadsheet for you, that's a great thing. If you can design AI to drive a car for you, you know, my 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 eldest is twenty three. She loves driving a car. I'm fifty two, and I hate driving. And if I know that I'm going to get up every day and there's driverless cars around me, they're all going to take me wherever I want to go at the time I want to go there so I can continue being productive with my time. Bring me that technology. Bring me that. I mean, I buy into that kind of philosophy.
So you mentioned uh, you're asking uh, you're asking uh, ChatGBT to do you an article on inflation. That must have been uh, that must have been subliminal preparation for for knowing what I was about to talk to you, <laughs> talk to you about today. <laughs> but I mean, like, in, inflation's uh, obviously something that is is on the tip of everyone's tongue. It's it's, it's in it's in, it's in every uh, every kind of media outlet at the minute. And uh, I guess you know, no matter what country you're living in now, and I guess you know, when we were in England, when we were in, in America, inflation is something that we probably all, almost felt immune to in the old days because it was some, something that happened in you know those countries over there but you know it, it's, it's something everybody's feeling everywhere I mean can you can you give me your I guess your your f- five minute viewpoint on how we've gotten to where we've gotten because again everyone's simple answer is oh it's Russia or oh, it's, it's the Ukraine I mean how have we gotten to where we've gotten to and I mean what you know what is the answer okay so there's there's, there's a couple of points to it but I, I think my f- my first experience with inflation was when I lived in Brazil in 1996. Brazil had just come out of hyperinflation, but the price of a loaf of bread was adjusted three times a day in a supermarket. Three times a day? With a, you know, like the guns with the price in, in, before they had barcodes. Three times a day, the price would go up. And when you got paid your salary at the end of the month, your, your objective, the moment you got paid, was to spend all of it. <laughs> because everything was going down in value in front of your eyes. Were you getting a higher salary month on month or was your salary always staying the same? It all depended, salary the same. Interest rates in the bank were 140%. So it was an environment where I noticed that everybody became very aware of numbers, calculations, and became very switched onto numbers very quickly. So being in that environment and watching that, that was like a massive extreme. I understood then what inflation really meant. When you look at inflation now, There's a lot of people out there that want to poo-poo what inflation is. And at the end of the day, it's really simple to understand. If you've got £100 in a bank account, at the end of 12 months, if that bank account's not making any interest, then the spending power of that £100 is less. It's less than it's £93 or uh, £92. But people still see the £100. So they don't go, oh, I've got £92. I've still got £100. It's like, well, you haven't because it can't buy as much. So what you've got to do is say, what am I going to spend the £100 on? Groceries have gone up by 40 to 50%. Eggs have gone up by 59% in the last 12 months. And people don't pay attention to that. That's that's how much more money it costs you to buy the things that you were buying a year ago. Interest rates in banks are low. The base rate of interest has gone up and up and up, and it's likely to continue to go up. But the, the, pay, the payment they're going to give you on your money at best at the moment is around 4%. So you've got 4% and you've got inflation at 8%, then you've got a 4% differential. And it, people just want to turn a blind eye to this. But what you have is official figures and then real figures, okay? Official figures are, if we were, we've kept inflation to five or six or 7%, that's just nonsense. Try and book a, a flight with an airline right now and look at the price it is right now compared to how it was 12 months ago. Airline flights are hugely expensive. Go and rent a car, go and get a hotel room in Dubai. Did you see on the news yesterday? The average price of a hotel room in Dubai, the average price, bear in mind one star to five star, is $480 per night. Is that what it is? That's the average price. If you go to the Mandarin Oriental, a standard room for one night is 6,000 dirhams. I mean, I mean I've mean, i really noticed, I'm going off on a slight tangent, but I've really noticed coming back in October, having not been here since April, that everything feels materially more expensive to me. And I, I, I've, I've never, you know, I've never really been one to, to, to notice, let's say, day to day pricing. You know, I go to the supermarket, it costs what it costs. I go to the restaurant, it costs what it costs. But, you know, I use a lot of Uber Eats, Deliveroo, that kind of stuff over here. And I, I feel it's, you know, every meal I get is really noticeable. Like I, I used to talk about how I've just used Uber. Didn't even notice it was, it was a three quid fare. I mean, there's no three, there's no three quid Ubers anymore. You know, the, the nine quid, 10 quid, 11 quid. And the same with Uber Eats. And then at the, at the other end of the scale, uh, I mean, I, w- I was renting an apartment here uh, back in, well, from last November to last, a- last April, six months. And I had a, I had three bedroom, three bedroom place in the address, which was obviously new and nice and expensive. And I was still working in Sterling. I was paying 12 and a half thousand quid a month for, th- for, a th- for a three bedroom place there. Came back this time, need, just needed a two bedder just to tide me over while my place was being ready. Rang them up, said, you know, I'll, I'll come back. Can I have two beds? They said, yeah, we'll send you our new price list. I'm thinking, oh, it'll be 10 grand or something. Two bedrooms, 20,000 quid a month. I mean, outrageous. Unbelievable. Outrageous. When I first moved here 18 years ago, it cost 70 dirhams to fill my Range Rover up. 70 dirhams. Okay, you always had change out of the money. And 
Now it costs me, I don't know, 300 dirhams or 250 dirhams or whatever it is. Everything's gone up, everything's gone up and people are just, they're, they're, they're not understanding it. Now, what has caused inflation? So you can say there's been a there's been a problem because Russia have invaded Ukraine. That's not what caused inflation. Has there been a supply chain issue? Yes. Well, that then does a supply and demand issue. That means we can't get stuff. People want stuff. So they put the prices up because there's more demand than there is supply. That's not what causes inflation. What causes inflation is taking the value of a currency and having a government that's allowed to print as much of it as they want. That's how inflation is caused. So when you have something that's valued, the dollar, which, which was the gold standard once, it's not the gold standard anymore. The government in America is allowed to print as much as they want. The more they print, the more they devalue a currency. Now you've seen this in uh, Zimbabwe, you've seen this in Nigeria, you've seen this in many countries of Brazil, okay? You see it in Argentina at the moment, you know, in these more developing countries, you see this constant need to print money up because of corrupt officials wanting to take some money out of the pot or whatever it is, debts need to be paid and the currency then is devalued. That's what you have with inflation, you have a devalue. The money is worth less. And so the cost of that has to go up. The interest rates have to go up to try and bring more value to it. Because if there's no interest being paid on pounds, who wants to buy pounds? But if there's 10% interest being paid on pounds, who wants to buy pounds? Lots of people do. And so that's why they do it. And so for me, when you, when you look at inflation, it's important to take a really, really deep understanding of it and how it impacts your life. You've noticed it. Everybody else, funnily enough, notices it. Everyone says, you know what, going to the cinema costs more money now. Or, you know, going to the supermarket, I used to pay a thousand dirhams a week, now I'm paying 1,500 dirhams a week. Oh, you know what, when I fill up the petrol, like I just did, well, when I go to the Mall of the Emirates, everyone says that very flippantly, but yet they still leave their money in a bank account at 2%. And it's like, why would you do that? So how how do we reverse it in real terms? I mean, if it's, I don't want to oversimplify it because I guess it's not that, it's not simple, but if it's as simple as the fact that governments printing money is what causes inflation, you know, how, how, how do we reverse you, it? You, you don't, the man on the street doesn't. What the man on the street has to do is to find a way to get more income from his money than inflation. So if inflation is at 7%, let's say, how can I get more than 7% on my money? Leaving it in the bank's not going to do that. Okay, I've got to essentially got to invest it. And so what do I invest it in that can give me a yield that's a bigger than 7% yield? So let's say it's 10% so I can net down a 3% gain. That's how I, as an individual, fight inflation. Uh, okay, but then how how can a government or you know if if you know society wants to, wants to either reverse inflation or improve inflation? How how can that happen? Or well, what governments do is yeah. they put interest rates up. By putting interest rates up, that means that their currency becomes more attractive. Okay, becoming more attractive means more people buy that currency. More people buy that currency, that then slows inflation down. That's what has to happen, and that's why interest rates are going up. Governments need people to buy the dollar, the pound, the euro, whatever it is. And you see that if you go to any country in the world where the currency is on the floor because of inflation, you see interest rates outrageous. Go to Egypt, that's not far from us. Interest rates are really high at the moment. Last week, the Egyptian pound lost 15% against the dollar. And so if you put your money in a bank account in Egypt, you'll get 25, 30% interest on it in a bank account. So on the surface of it, you, you know, the, the average person would go, oh, I better buy Egyptian currency, I get 30% a year on that. But in real terms, yeah. that's not what you're getting. So, and uh, Let's just move move this slightly away from inflation onto onto you know government debt, knackered economies, and, and I, I want to get your view on this because I I, I have a so it's not not so much a theory but an analogy. So obviously I spend I spend you know all my days dealing with businesses who want to borrow money, and most of the businesses I deal with are impaired in some way. You know, be polite to them. Um, but what what you what you tend what you tend to find in in all of these knackered businesses is that there's there's some decent underlying fundamentals you know there's, there's there's some income there's some customers there's some profitability but you know it's saddled in some way shape or form by too many by too many legacy issues and and i guess as an as an analogy you know that's what i would compare now to so many countries so many countries you know if let's use it use england we're, we're both from there so if you look at these knackered businesses you know from a an emotionless business perspective it's quite it's quite easy uh, if you can be dispassionate and uh, I guess ruthless about it and say, well, look, here's a business. It's, you know, it turns over 10 million pounds. It makes a million pounds, but it's got 9 million pounds of debt associated with it. Unfortunately, that business is probably just going to tread water or get worse forever because of the debt. So what we need to do to it is we need to put it through an insolvency process 
clean it up, it comes out the other side, and it's then got 10 million pounds, you know, 10 million pounds of income, 1 million pound of profit, and little to no debt, and therefore it's then a strong, sustainable, growing business. To put it through that process is going to involve, you know, some embarrassment, some pain, some, some uncomfortable conversations. But once those uncomfortable conversations and that horrible situation has occurred, what comes out the end is a strong, you know, sustainable, viable business. Now, my and you know, please shoot me down and tell me I've, I've completely missing the point. But my simplistic view of, uh, you know, of a knackered country like England is, well, we have the, we have the same problem there. In that we've got we've got income we've got you know we've got income and profitability if you like and plenty to offer but we're just utterly saddled saddled by debt and people go well when's it going to end when's it going to end and I look at it and think well to me it's it's no different to a business we've only got two two options for you know for England we either keep printing more and more and more money like a business taking more and more debt and that previous example I've just given would be that nine million of debt becomes ten becomes eleven and okay there's still still the same income but you, you're exacerbating that problem and nothing will change until somebody takes the pill or you know you, the country somehow goes through some kind of bankruptcy process come, come comes out the other end which will involve some you know I guess someone putting the hand up and pulling the trigger which no one's going to want to do because polit pol politically even though it might be the right thing they're never they're never going to get uh, you know they're, they're never going to get put in, put back into power again but using that analogy how, how how does it how does it ever end because you know these countries are printing so much money and, and creating so much debt that they can never ever fix that deficit in any well, in generational lifetimes or have I am I talking up no, 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 you're not talking wrong at all but let's let, let's take that knackered company how did that knackered company get knackered? Probably because the leadership was wrong. Wrong people running yeah? it, yeah. So the wrong people running the business. So what have you got to do? You've got to take those people out of the business or you've got to retrain those people. Now, imagine you didn't bankrupt that business and you and I went in and we jumped into that business and we said, right, we've got a big hole here. Okay, yeah, we can go insolvent or we can fight. All right? There was some holes are too big to fill though, aren't they? Well, let's, let's take the knackered business as an example. And we go and we fight and we turn it around and we reduce the debt from 9 million to 8 million to 7 million to 6 million because we've been really smart about it. Okay, we cut costs. Okay, we're very careful. We boost revenues coming in. We're careful about how the money's spent. All of this kind of stuff that great businesses have got. When you look at the, any country and take the UK as your example, you have this big debt. Okay, and the only way to get rid of that debt is austerity. That's the only way because it's a debt. You can't write the debt off. You can't become a bankrupt country. The UK can't yeah. do this. So that, that that insolvency isn't then an option. So what's the only other option? It's to say, let's stop spending money, just like a business. And when I when I when I go around the world to different countries I've lived in, I was in in Nepal filming the documentary for human trafficking in, in the summer of last year. All I do is I, I walk around the country and I'm like, and I look at the country and I go, badly run business. I look at it and I'm like, the natural resources here, badly run business. I take Nigeria, where I lived as a kid. Nigeria has got some of the most high quality, easily accessible oil that exists anywhere on the planet. It's in the swamps, not far from the land, okay? So this oil is there. It should be one of the richest countries in the world because of its natural resources, but it's not, okay? Badly run business. Now, how do you solve those problems? Well, Nigeria is corrupt from top to bottom visibly and we all talk about it and we say if there was no corruption there then guess what we could solve this problem the uk is just as corrupt as nigeria except it's a bit under the table and so that corruption that exists why do people want to become prime minister do they want to change the country or do they want some call you know we just saw theresa may's pay statements for the speaking gigs that she does now and she oh, was she she's, she's being paid but 2.3 million a year to speak oh really okay theresa may she was you know a lot you know, how much does barack obama get paid to speak you know they get sat on the boards of these companies they're able to lobby and influence in government and yada 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 why did you and i not want to become a politician because when we were young, young, we looked at it and thought, who would want to do that job? But there are people out there that see the long game and the long game is to be able to be, you know, for their own lives, okay, have that future, power and control. What is a guy that runs a business, that owns a business and grows a business? A lot of time it's power and control. So when I look at it, I'm like, until you're prepared to make really tough decisions, like really tough decisions, that piss everyone off if they have to, and everyone has to leave if that's the only way to live with it, then you're gonna carry on creating further and further debt. Our business, we'd have to maybe fire half the staff. Maybe we'd upset the other half because they don't get lunch hours and they've got to work seven days a week now. 
we'd have to deal with that. Maybe we then have to recruit new people in. Well, the UK doesn't have the ability to do that. The only way it can do it is gently use austerity as its tool and make sure that the people that are actually managing the country are number crunchers. Because it's a checks and balances thing, isn't it? Just like insolvency and growth and profit and all that kind of stuff. You have an IPO, it's checks and balances. Who's running it? Now, is Rishi Sunak the right guy to do it? I don't know, okay? I've, I've never seen a politician yet that I've believed enough to think that they're the right man. But you sometimes get inklings, don't you? But, but do you think any, any of them, and I'm, complete, I'm completely with you, and I guess, you know, I, I agree, yes, you can't bankrupt a company, I'm a, a country, I'm just, I, I guess I'm putting my, my two concepts of, of, of what's what, so I totally, totally agree with everything you're saying. But is it ever feasible that it does happen? Because even if you find a politician that you think has got the legs to do it, the, reali the, re the reality is there's probably so many hoops, et cetera, they've got to jump through, and only so it was such a period of time that they've got to do it well, in. Well, countries have gone bankrupt. Countries have gone bankrupt. Argentina went bankrupt. I remember when I was living down there, you could have a peso or you could have a dollar in your bank account and they were exactly the same. And overnight one, and it didn't matter. So let's say you had dollars and I had pesos. We had the same spending power every day. Overnight, the bank devalued the peso by 50%. So now it was two pesos to one dollar. So I had all my money in pesos. I got a thousand pounds in my bank account. You, so a thousand pesos, you got a thousand dollars. I've now got $500 worth of pesos. That happened overnight. Countries go bankrupt when they default on debt. Okay, Brady bonds were introduced yep. in Latin America many years ago, high interest loans, and Brady bonds were for high risk lending. If you take Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe went bankrupt. Nobody buys anything in Zimbabwe dollars now. They buy it in US dollars. The currency became literally not worth having. I've, I think I've got a 17 billion Zimbabwe dollar note at home somewhere, which is like three, three quid or three pence or something nonsense. I just, so, I just spoke to my missus this morning. I was, I was telling you that uh, she's in Bali, and uh, I mean, I've never been to Bali, so I, I know nothing about the current, the currency or the economy. Uh, but I can't remember what she told me she just bought, uh, but she said she, she just spent like one point three million, million, whatever, whatever yeah, the local rupees. currency it's, it's, it's is. It's Indonesian rupees. Oh, yeah. oh no, that's what she was telling me. She was telling me last time she was there, a million was worth a, worth a hundred dollars, and now a million's worth fifty dollars. I was like, a million? She's like, yeah, everyone's a millionaire in uh, in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, when you see these currencies, but countries, countries have done, you know, and if you look at these countries, you see South Africa's going that way as well. You look at these countries and you understand what's happening. It's really sad because most people have no influence to be able to make any change. And sometimes it needs an uprising. Sometimes it needs a, a war. Sometimes it needs a, the, the people just going enough for something to happen. But individually, we're just all pawns, aren't we? So you mentioned a minute ago about uh, when you were um, making a human, human trafficking documentary. And I know I've seen on social, you've done a bit of that stuff lately. And you've got your own podcast as well. Just tell me a bit about, I guess, you know, where, where, where that came from, how long you've been doing it for. So I think that it, look, it's all, everything stemmed from the podcast. So, so in, in, it, I'll, tell, I'll tell the story. I interview a guy in the podcast who has a TV show on Netflix called The Kindness Diaries. He's a guy called Leo Logo, Leon Logothetis. Leon comes from the fifth richest family in Greece. He's British, but Greek shipping family. Billionaires. He's the only one in the family that doesn't work for the family business. He made this TV show where he was, he was inspired by The Motorcycle Diaries, which was a movie many years ago traveled around the world on a motorbike, relying on the kindness of others. So he could accept food, he could accept shelter, and he could accept fuel for his motorbike, but he couldn't accept money. And when he experienced an extreme act of kindness, he decided to give them a life-changing gift as repayment. And that life-changing gift was truly for that person, a life-changing gift. And because he believes the world inherently is kind and he wanted to demonstrate that. And I loved the TV show, got him on the podcast. He told me about it. And at the end of the podcast, I literally was sat just like you and I are right now. I said, I'm a bit jealous of you. He's like, why? I'm like, because you got a TV show and I don't. And um, he said, well, how can I help you with that? I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, if you want a TV show, you can have one. He said, just needs a bit of planning. And I, 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 I never in my brain ever, ever thought, computed that I could ever have a TV show. And so every, he's in LA, every Saturday morning 
Friday night, his time, he gave me an hour for six weeks. And he said, let's brainstorm. He said, if you can make the hairs on my arm stand up, I'll help you make a TV show. So the first chat we had, you know, we went through different ideas and whatnot. And he said, look, let's think about what's important in the world at the moment. Let's think about sustainability. And they and, and slowly over the about four weeks, they come up with the guts of the show based around who I am and, and, and what I can do and stuff like that. But I, I got to the end of it and I'm like, but that's not what I want to make a TV show about. And I just met a guy who won the Nobel Peace Prize called Kailash Satyati, who saved 80,000 children out of child slave labor in India. And I watched the movie and then I met him in Dubai at the Capital Club and he told his story and I was really moved by him. And I'm like, that, I want to talk about that. And so I then went back to them. I said, look, this is my idea. This is what I want to do. Human trafficking, I really care about da, 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 da. And they're like, okay, fine. So then you need to, you know, work on that. And then from then was the embryo of a TV show. And we looked at that. We then found the people that were heroes. I employed a research team to start researching people. And then we started to film. And we created this documentary, which is about three women that have done remarkable work to save children from human trafficking and child slave labor. And that was the journey that we went on. And that was the TV show. And it and it's changed my life. Everything about my life changed. When does it, has it aired? Or when no, it's it? just, just finished being edited literally this month. And so it should be airing either next month or the month after. And what does that air on? Netflix. Oh, it's actually on Netflix. Had, had you already agreed to distribution before you filmed it then? Yeah. It was always going to be a, a Netflix thing. Yeah. So, awesome. and again, all through these people. So the production team, they've done lots of stuff like that. They know what they're doing. They came in. I mean, okay, you know, the, the first, where were we filming the first? We were, in, we were in Spain, in Madrid, doing the first part of the filming. And the director's like, you're shit. <laughs> He's like, you can't, this is not good enough. He's like, you need to be more this, you need to be more that. Bear in mind, everyone's speaking to me in Spanish, telling me their stories. And I've got literally a, an AirPod in my ear with someone translating what they're saying. So I'm not able to react in that moment. I have to wait for the translation and then go, <gasps> you know, even though they've said five seconds earlier something to make you go, ah, oh, and so. But how, how are they understanding what you're saying? Is someone translating for them? Yes. Oh, okay. But that, it's them that are telling the story mainly. Okay. The parts. But yes, the, the, everybody in the crew speaks Spanish apart from me. And um, and you say that uh, the show came off, off your podcast. How long have you been doing the podcast now? And uh, what, what made you start doing that? So four years ago, I started. Didn't want to do it. Someone persuaded me to do it. Um, we're 230, 40 episodes in. We've done one a week every week for the last four years. Um, and it's been... It's just been such a remarkable experience because just like you, you know, you and I both sat here right now, but you get to meet really interesting people. You learn their stories, you build relationships, you build connections and all of that kind of stuff is really good for, it's really good for me because you can become very insular with just your crowd, your community, the people you work with, the people you socialize with. And the podcast has just opened up this whole world of people to me that I didn't even know existed. Um, and also giving me access to people that maybe are my heroes a little bit as well, you know Tony Robbins and stuff along the way. Yeah, I think I, think, I, think I was saying that to you about mine when, when I when I first met uh, when we first met um, you know a few months ago, whenever it was, and um, you know. I mean, I'm what probably four years in as well myself now. Like I don't know, 150, 160 episodes of an audio one, and a load, a load of videos. But it's really only, only the last six or seven months that it's I've finally got some track, got some traction. You know, the the, the views are snowballing, the listen, listeners are snowballing. And I did it for you know for such a long time. And people always used to say to me, "Well, but why do you do it? What do you get out of it?" And I always used to say that I can't you know overemphasize enough how even if not one single person ever listened to it or not one single person ever watched it, the the relationships that I get to make you know from the people I get to meet or the opportunities it gives me or the or the you know, say you know, perception of credibility when walking into business just you know cannot be overstressed. And I, I really could not you know recommend enough a podcast for anyone. Two things to that. Ken Rakowski did the first ever podcast in 1996. Okay, came on my, my show and he said to me, how many listeners do you think you need? I was like, oh, I don't know, let me just talk to various numbers. He said, you don't need any. He goes, you don't need any. He goes, think of, think of a podcast as a prospecting tool. He said, imagine you wanted to do business with 10 of the biggest XYZ industry companies here in Dubai. And you just invited the CEO of each of those companies onto your show to come and share their story and inspire your audience. You're gonna have an hour, maybe an hour and a half with that person. You're gonna have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee afterwards or before. 
And I guarantee you four weeks after that podcast episode is released, you call him and say, the episode's out now, people really love it. Thank you so much for coming on and inspiring everybody. I've got a couple of questions. Can I have a coffee, please? That person is gonna say yes to you. He said, so as a prospecting tool, you then go out and you see 10 of your ideal prospects, whoever they may be, what a great way to do business. And at that moment, I was like, ah, okay, I see why he started it. And he's done 20,000 interviews now. Really? I, I interviewed um, John Lee Dumas last night. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. What was his stats? I think he'd, he'd just, he'd done 3,400 episodes. 3,400, he's done an episode every single day since 2012. It's nuts you say that, because I met a guy, when I was when I was in um, LA filming the podcast, I met a guy and he said to me, how many podcast episodes have you done? I said, oh, we had 250 or whatever it is, oh, all these numbers. And he goes, oh, right. He goes, how long have you been doing it? I said, oh, four years. He said, oh, right. He goes, I've only been doing mine a year. I said, how many episodes have you done? He said, over 400. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you've been going a year. This guy was like a 65-year-old psychologist. And I was like, you bastard. <laughs> but 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 that's that's another way, I guess, you know, another avenue of looking at podcasts as well, of, of the ability, how easy it is to create mass amounts of content, you know, not, not too complicated. I mean, again, go back to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, not putting quality over so not putting quantity over quality and producing absolute shit but you know as long as, long as you've as long as you've got the you know the basics of what you're doing you know it, it's it's so easy to get to get vast amounts of content out there and i don't think you know other business owners whether it's you know for their business or for a ceo as a personal brand i really do think that they they overthink it and over over worry about how, how complicated it is and all the excuses that get in the way of doing it and i'm not going to say just get out there and record because okay or, or maybe i should you should just say yeah get out there and record because it doesn't matter how much preparation you do your first one's going to be shit your tenth one's going to be awful you know and, and and it's probably by number 45 or 50 that you know that you're actually starting to get bearable but it really is just so 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 easy to you know to, to get uh you know to, to get to that kind of number yeah mate everyone's full of excuses aren't they all these people that don't do this kind of stuff are full of excuses and, and you know that as well as i do um you just have to like with everything you just got to start you just got to try it and it doesn't cost a fortune you can do your first episode on your phone and yes you're going to be shit at first but everybody is so you're not you're not special <laughs> you know everybody is i look at my first ever videos that i made and, and I, when i made them i was like they're amazing <laughs> i literally made them i look back and i'm like yeah you've you've got this Ben. <laughs> and i look at them now and i'm like what was i thinking <laughs> i mean I, I remember at, my, at the time I first did mine. I mean, I couldn't even watch it. I mean, I, I didn't look back at them and go, oh, they look amazing. I mean, I used to have to give them to someone else. I said, you just edit them as you see fit because, <laughs> because I can't even bring myself to watch myself. And then I, then I probably got to a stage where I thought, no, no, I can, I can watch it. It's tolerable. I can, I can, uh, I can make a few improvements. And, uh, you know, then, then you get to a stage where you think, oh, actually, actually, you know, I don't know whether I've thought I've got good or I've just become immune to how bad I am. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I can, I can actually sit, uh, I can actually sit there watching it now. <laughs> <laughs> You've got it. You've got it. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's, it's funny with the weight loss as well, isn't it? Because I mean, I, I, I never, I never saw myself as fat, right? I mean, I've always thought, okay, I could lose a few pounds, you know, and I, I, I need to lose a few pounds, but never thought, oh, that, I'm a big guy. And since since I started, you know, really hammering my weight loss from, let's say, April of last year, I've lost about ten kilograms. And I now look back at some of my old videos, videos which, bear in mind, I was happy to post. So I thought I'm, I'm, I must have thought I looked all right. I'm not going to say good, but I must have thought I looked passable enough to post. I look at them now, I think, who's that fat guy? I think, who? Oh, god, it's me, and, and, and they're abs absolutely awful. So, uh, so I yeah. know exactly what you mean. I've got there's a photo at home of me at a friend's wedding, and I've got a stripy shirt on. And I was at my heaviest, I was 93 kilos. And literally the stripe goes like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at it and I'm like, how was I ever that fat? You know, how did that ever happen? But um, yeah, that, that's one of the things that we have to deal with, you know, making this kind of content is that that, that, that weight does change, that the wrinkles start to show and whatnot. And like when you sat down here, now this is my side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know why I say that to you. It's, it's just, it's just more, more habit than anything uh, <laughs> Why did else. you say that? You came and sat down here, but no, I want to sit that side. Yeah, no, because I always sit on this side. Why? I don't know. I've just, I've just gotten used to it. I mean, like in my head, I think, oh, I must look better on that side, but I don't really think it may. It's actually not how I think I look. It's how I, I like to, I like to swing this way and look at you that way, as opposed to swing, swing the other way, not for, not for psychological reasons, just for just for motions, <laughs> <laughs> reasons of motion. <laughs> Great.
<laughs> well, listen, Spencer, I'm conscious it must be almost your bedtime, given that you've been <laughs> given that you've been up since four o'clock. Yeah, I'll go and have, I'll have my, my glass of milk. Can I get tucked <laughs> in? <laughs> but listen, thanks a lot for being here, buddy. Uh, it's been it's been, been great that we finally got to sit down and do it, and I hope it will be hope it will be the first of many. Uh, I mean, look before you go. Obviously, you, you've got the you've got the show that's got upcoming soon. But where, where can people find you? Where can people uh, you know follow your content? Well, un- unfortunately, unfortunately, my name sounds like an old people's home, so it's easy not <laughs> to forget it. And uh, and having a name like that, you only you, you've only got to go out there and find on social media Spencer Lodge on Insta, but the Spencer Lodge podcast, it's all the same. But if anybody wants to go and enjoy the content, then it's there on YouTube as well. But yeah, go just go 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 hunt. Perfect. Thanks a lot. And guys, as always, if you've enjoyed listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, you can catch me over on YouTube and see my shiny face today. Been a bit of a very shiny, dripping face because of the heat. Uh, and if you watch it over on YouTube, you can get me on iTunes and Spotify and wherever you want to listen to your podcasts. Uh, and as always, I am the Matt Haycox. So that's T-H-E-M-A-T-T-H-A-Y-C-O-X on all things social. So until next time, thank you very much. Mm-hmm.